trustees, colleagues, friends, students, and especially the class of 2020, it's my privilege and distinct honor to welcome you to the 174th Convocation of Tilton School. For 174 years, we have marked the beginning of our school year with this ceremony, and we embrace a tradition that encompasses approximately six generations and close to 40,000 graduates of this school. There is a sense of history and a connection in this moment, and I hope you feel it. At this time, I am pleased to ask our Dean of Students, Ms. Chapel Love, Tilton School Class of 1994, to the podium for our invocation. Ms. Love. Students, colleagues, and friends, welcome. Tonight is an opportunity for us to pause, breathe, and be present. In this time of transition, from our busy days of summer, from friends and family at home, to this shared space and time together, let us slow our thoughts and accept ourselves and one another exactly as we are. At this moment, the renowned, the renowned Swiss psychiatrist and scientist Carl Jung wrote, the least of things with a meaning is worth more in life than the greatest of things without it. We are embarking on a year of discovery together. New friends, new ideas, new experiences. And no doubt, you have planned for and anticipate all the great things you will accomplish and the opportunities ahead. Yet as you sit here, set between others that you may or may not know, aware of their movements, conscious of the closeness, I urge you to let go of thoughts about tomorrow, thoughts about this year, thoughts about your future. I urge you to be present, to acknowledge the ways we are changed simply through this, least of things, the quiet acceptance of one another through our presence, our closeness in this shared moment. Let us bring meaning to now through this awareness. Let us bring meaning to this moment through our gratitude for one another and for this time and place. <coughs> May we accept ourselves just as we are and cherish those who sit beside us in contemplation and who merely through their presence connect us meaningfully, meaningfully to this time and place. Amen. <coughs> Mr. Francisco, how's our volume back there? It's good? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Love. Madison Kirker was elected by our community to serve as our student body president. I'm especially hopeful for this year because Maddie's energetic confidence has become apparent to us in all of her contributions to the life of our school. She has set a high standard through her words, but most importantly, through her actions. I know that she will serve us well as our student body president during her tenure. I present to you Ms. Madison Mackenzie Kirker. But they can be cyclical. 
Neither that, neither the ten-year-old me or the kids I saw in the lobby this past summer realized that such a moment could be shared. With this deeper idea in mind, I began to think of my time at my second home, Tilton. I also thought of those who came before me, as well as those who were followed. These recurring moments, like sitting in this chapel, playing games in the quad, or hanging out in the middle lobby, the hair-raising moments we experienced, hair-raising moments we experienced during Cutter Keg as our pride was on the line for this long-standing rivalry. Our competitive spirit heard through chants and cheers on the sidelines with faint echoes of past <coughs> students lingering in the background. There are other moments like watching Blaine Manning and Sarah Moran take their final bow as four-year seniors on the stage in Hamilton. These unforgettable memories are unique to the individual but are constantly shared by others. <coughs> there are some these are some examples of the threads that connect us to all members of the Zilton community, past, present, and future. Here at Zilton, it's important to appreciate every moment that happens, whether it's watching my roommates trip over the insane amount of bags they have that they definitely didn't need, or having to clean up past crew leadership responsibilities often at last year's moving up ceremony. All our experiences, great and small, have meaning in our lives. Being here makes me live in the moment so much that I often don't stop to think until now that all the little things I experience I will cherish for the rest of my life. I challenge everyone in this chapel to recognize these moments as they happen. Though our experiences will never be the same as the person to our left, the person 20 years ago, or the person 10 years from now, we will always share a common bond that makes each one of us a ram. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. This afternoon, standing before you, I'm ready. I'm energized. This school, without its students, is merely empty buildings, hollow shelves that lack vigor and purpose. When you fill our hallways, this school comes alive, and we're now ready to strike out on our path for this year. A new chapter in our collective lives, a point of departure. And it's with this departure that I'm reminded why I do what I do. After being a father, a husband, being your head of school has been the greatest privilege of my life. I embrace the opportunity to help continue the great tradition of Tilton School. For me, this means articulating our strategic direction hiring the best possible people, and ensuring our financial health. Those are big responsibilities, and I take them all seriously. I spend a lot of time listening, learning, deciding, and of course, fixing mistakes that I make along the way. We are all familiar with the axiom that we learn more from our mistakes than our successes. And although I hope I have reduced the number of mistakes, I still make them. And I made one on Saturday that taught me two important lessons. To set the stage, you need to know about work crew. Work crew is the opportunity to spend time with me for two hours early in the morning. Usually we end up splitting wood for fires, or clearing the cross-country trail, or shoveling the pathways before maintenance wakes up. Anyone can participate in work group, <laughs> but usually it's reserved for people to give back to the community after making a poor choice. And normally we don't have work group until the school year gets started, but this past weekend, we had two students who made a mistake. And this was great timing because I needed to plant two brand new maple sugar trees. And so tonight, when you leave the chapel, look across the field to the right-hand side, and you will see two small maple sugar saplings with water bags. I'm pretty proud of those trees, and I know my two helpers are too. But my mistake 
on Saturday does not involve these two young men in our workroom, but what happened during our time together. You see, while we were working, a student came running out of the knolls and came up to us. It was Howard Yen. <laughs> Howard, where are you? Did you come tonight, Howard? Yes, that, right there. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> and in a very enthusiastic way, Howard said, Good morning, Mr. Saliba. I'm here. <laughs> now, I knew that Howard had slept through soccer practice the day before. And so I had made an assumption that he had been assigned to morning work group. And I also knew that his sidekick, Sean, had missed some other commitments as well. As well. So I said, Howard, you're late and you know where Sean is. Howard looked at me in a confused way, but said quickly he knew where Sean's room was and that he would go and get him right away. And I said, hustle up, buddy. We need you out here right away. He came back shortly without Sean, <laughs> saying that Sean would be here soon. And I said, that's fine, grab the shovel. I'm going to get to work right away. <coughs> 30 minutes later, <laughs> Sean shows up. <laughs> and boy, is he cheerful. Good morning, Mr. Saliba. <laughs> and of course, I was not pleasant. I was not pleasant. I had a pretty bad attitude. I told them to start weeding and that I'd be back in a few minutes with a rake. And at that moment, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with that rake, but I knew I had to go and get it. And they got to work right away. When I got back, I'd only gotten more upset. How could these two boys be late for work group? How could they be late for work group? And as I'm trying to think about what else I can have them do to extend their contribution to the school, Sean comes up and says, Mr. Saliba, Howard and I were talking, and both of us don't know why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of excuses before. Okay? And I said, give me a break, boys. You mean to tell me that you just woke up, came out of Knowles, and rolled up to work group, and no one told you to do that? Something doesn't seem right to you. Something doesn't seem right here to me. And that's when Howard looked at me and said, this is work group? <laughs> <laughs> I came out of the door because the schedule said we had soccer practice at 6.30 in the morning, and I thought this was soccer practice. <laughs> <laughs> And at that moment, at that moment, I realized I had made a mistake. And all of us started laughing. And I apologized to the boys for making them work, and also for my frustration, which was unwarranted. I felt terrible about it. But then also, I was pretty excited because they thought I was a soccer coach. <laughs> One of the lessons I learned from this experience was how I should never assume. Because I assumed that Howard and Sean were assigned to work through, I thought they were late, and therefore I was frustrated. And instead of assuming, I'll be sure to check in with everyone who shows up at 6 o'clock in the morning before jumping to conclusions. The second lesson that I learned is that some of the best learning that we do, that we do, students and adults, some of the best learning that we do is in the small moments. Brief conversations and interactions that seem so small often lead to big thoughts and big epiphanies. My time with Howard and Sean was not after a class, an important game, or some other significant event. It was a 30-second conversation and one that I will hold on to as an important example for my learning, for my role as a head of school. And this gets back to why I do what I do. I do what I do because I think the world around us does not appreciate teenagers or their potential. Here at Tilton, we strive to allow you to investigate, reflect, and to get feedback on the skills you are trying to cultivate so that you can really clock when you graduate. It is a noble and honorable endeavor one that I take seriously and also with great happiness. 
and it requires a positive outlook. Something that I learned again from Howard and Sean. The work before us this year will have difficult moments, but I promise you there will be great joy. I encourage you to appreciate the small moments that appear everywhere in our lives. I'm thankful that I can play a small part in your journey forward, and I cannot wait for this year to get started. Thank you. Tonight, I welcome our guests, Mr. Harold Bailey and Mrs. Bernstein Bailey. Mr. Bailey served on the Tilton Board of Trustees since 2016 and was a member of the Tilton School Class of 1966. In 2006, he received the George L. Clinton Award, which is given to a Tilton School alum for their outstanding achievements and significant contribution to society. Mr. Bailey is a trustee emeritus at Brown University and holds an honorary PhD in letters as well as bachelor's degrees in applied mathematics and philosophy. Currently, he serves as the executive vice president of McLeod Associates, an information technology consulting firm. Previously, he served as CEO Americas for Show Business Software, and prior to his retirement in 2000, he was the IBM Vice President for Lotus Marketing Integration. Mr. Bailey serves as local community as an active board member of the Westport Country Playhouse, the Team Westport, and was the 2005 recipient of the Anti-Defamation League's Distinguished Community Leadership Award for Barefoot County. Please give a warm welcome to our convocation speaker, Mr. Harold Bailey. Hello, Tilton. It is, uh, it is an it is great. It's a real joy to be here. And uh, first, I want to welcome me. I want to welcome you uh, for the, on behalf of the Student Program Committee of the Board, as well as the Board of Law. We couldn't be more excited about this year and the advent of education, some of the changes that are coming with respect to education here at Tilton. And you're all part of that. We can talk a little bit about that. What I'd like to do first is give you a little bit of input on my journey uh, here at Tilton as a student, and then my journey back, and then get into a little bit about the education I was talking about. By the way, as I walked over, it kind of hit me that I, had, I was actually here as this building was rolled up the hill and to put in place. Um, we never had an opening convocation while I was here in this building, but uh, we did have some classes in my senior year, and they were the only classes in the classrooms that were air conditioned at the time here. So I've got some fond memories of this chapter. <laughs> when I sat where you are some 50 years ago, I arrived from a world that would be nearly unrecognizable to most people. I was I was one of millions of Americans from the U.S. South who were legally barred from using water fountains, eating in the same restaurants, lunch counters, sitting in the same waiting rooms for train station, for trains, buses, riding farther up in the rear of the bus, using the same libraries, or attending the same schools. All of that was because we couldn't attend those schools or attend those other facilities as white Americans, simply because we were black Americans. While I had a loving community, and as our black community was a very loving one, including our own schools, churches, restaurants, barber shops, hairdressers, insurance company, funeral homes, and so on. Ours was a community that was distinctly opportunity constrained culturally and racially versus white community around us. In fact, even though our city was 70% white, I never had a conversation with a white person, including someone of my own age, for more than 60 seconds until I was 13 years old. Now, 
Peter mentioned the small things, which I kind of call the little things. And uh, I look at those small things that are important now, and I put them in two categories. First are the gets. The gets are the small or little things from others which have changed my perspectives or changed my life. The others are the gifts. And those are the little things from me which have affected perspectives of the lives of others. Before children, I was blessed with great many gifts from my church and teachers which shaped my knowledge, values, and motivations. I was a mantra for my parents to learn as much as I could about as many different things as I could. Quote, because they could never take that away from me, in form. They motivated my youth and much of the rest of my life. In my ninth grade year, I won a scholarship to summer school at Exeter, and afterwards decided to attend a different prep school every summer until I graduated. But it was the very next year following summer school in Tilton that Headmaster Herbert Moore mentioned to my parents and me that he'd like to have me return to a fall session, but had no funds to do so. And he promised to check a few sources that realistically didn't think there was a chance uh, that we could make it happen. And as we reached the barrier about two years, two, two weeks before school, we'd all been written off the fall session here for me, and I was headed back to school in Oxford. When uh, one of the biggest gifts in my life happened, and that came in from one of the telegram that read, we have a place for you. Now, of course, it totally changed my life. And in fact, that's a gross understatement. Here, I worked with sword and navigate new culture and, of course, new knowledge. And the gets continued in the moment from my faculty as well as students. When I had to make a choice between several top colleges, um, including some ideas, frankly, it was the get input from my roommate. Which most strongly influenced my decision to go to Brown. I've talked so far about gifts, but it's truly the gifts, uh, the influence that I've been able to have to tell others that's been most rewarding for me. Over my career and involvement, I've been blessed to see unsolicited thanks from major leaders, including the head of the World Bank, the CEO of Starbucks. Founder of Yahoo, already the impact that was received by them from my personal involvement. It was from the initiatives I've worked with to implement the business and not the profit side that have been the most rewarding. Uh, those for which I received widespread thanks from a great many people. Truly, it's the gifts that keep on giving and are most valuable in my experience. It was in this spirit of giving back that I came back until the several years ago as a trustee. And since then, I've been ecstatic about the educational leadership which is taking place here with a tilt and master approach, of which you are all a part. First, let's take a look at the uh, tilt and master approach definition. And if you're aware of it, I'm sure not to have your eyes glazed over. The master approach is a customized learning process that puts the student in the driver's seat of their education. More than pedagogy or educational philosophy alone, it provides a view for students to discover their potential, explore their interests, show, and show their strengths uh, as they master essential skills across all areas of student life. That vehicle is customized for each student to an ongoing regimen of intentional investigations, guided self-reflection, and honest feedback from back as a result, rather than a one-size-fits-all model in which students are evaluated according to a strict academic rubric, the mastery approach extends to the evaluated areas of skill mastery from the classroom to areas such as athletics, residential life, community involvement, extra campus partnerships, and extracurricular activities. Now, why is this so important? Well, to get some perspective, to give you some graphic Yeah, 
Jews, can it sound Okay, let's take a look at the way education has been conducted for the past few centuries. There are a set of courses, content is on the left, many set of courses, very few set of outcomes. And those courses have been designed around having to achieve those outcomes. So for example, I think it's geography or whatever. That has a little set of on outcomes. And it's inside the classroom that achievement is demonstrated. That's where the action takes place. Okay. Now, the bottom line here is that your permanent record, your lifetime of work, really boils down to a set of <coughs> grades, that are letter grades, for different courses that are taken throughout your record. So, keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at the book and ask Clearly having that as a record for what you've achieved 
is not only helpful for you in terms of getting into college and for future employers, employers, but it's also something that would be very important in terms of you helping the learning to understand what, what you're excited about, what you're good at, who you are. And that is the real work of the master approach. The question is, how do you manage all this stuff? And how do you make it? And that's what a personal analytic program study for the technology that's going to be involved. The new system to which you, as I'm saying, going to be uh, introduced very shortly comes into play. And there, what we have is the technology that will be able to pull all this together. And we're talking about the introductions so at the beginning of setting the foundation for that technology so that you will be able to have all of those kind of capabilities inside of your group records um, as you go through your training tool. And you'll be able to use that to decide how you want to do and what's important to you in a way that wouldn't have been possible with this classroom learning. Um, so whether it's called PGPS or GPS, that is the system that can help bring all these things together. And but it's, what's really important about this is that only works to the extent that what Peter talked about, the small things are like all the gifts and the gets and the little things are taking place. Because while the vehicle can be that technology, the fuel to make this whole thing work will be the degree to which you are engaged, to which you are involved in uh, giving advice, helping people assess things, providing some, some, some gifts to others, and making this whole thing work. <coughs> so, in terms of mastery approach, I just wanted to give you that as a quick overview. There's been tremendous national leadership. Mike Landridge, and the administrators, and Shannon Parker, here in Tolkien. And they not only extended their reputations nationally, but they've been able to take the entire school's reputation with the work that's being done. And if you want to know who's paying attention to this radical change, this change in education that's taking place, look at the who's who of college secondary schools that are involved in the organization that's helping helping uh, sort this out and put it together. I have to tell you that the work of Tilton in terms of putting together the mastery transfer work and putting together the ways in which this is supposed to be rolled out, as well as the modular technology, which is about to take place, uh, has put Tilton in a real leadership role. In fact, as Shannon mentioned, she could probably spend the day just answering questions from other top schools and uh, if you also want to, in addition to other secondary schools and peers that are leading schools in this country, there are also top members of the university and the college community. There are a number of members of the top three, and there are a number of those that involve with the organization that's helping put this together. So getting this to work is important, not just to children, but also to the nation. And most importantly, <coughs> The introduction of this technology and the rollout and continued success of the mastery approach is a tremendous opportunity for you to master who you are as well at the same time that you're learning new skills. It's also a tremendous opportunity to be part of shaping the future of education in this country. Now, the term I have at the bottom there is proactive engagement, and that's business speed which I get beat up by a number of people. But, but what it means is, in order for this to work, it means that this is, you, have to, you have to have your patience and your willingness to be involved in order to make the success as we move forward. And I guess the best way to say it is, you have to own it. You have to own it for Tilton. You have to own it for the nation. And you have to own it for yourselves. And I'm happy with what I can tell you that we will be there every step of the way to help you. Thank you.
is going to lead us in our tilt and alma mater. And so what I'd like to do, I'd like to have everybody stand. And grab your programs, because on the back are the words. And uh, Mr. Sheehy, I cannot believe that you were up there and I'm right here. I guess you're singing. Okay. <laughs>